There have been an awful lot of attempts to put Jesus back into the grave. Um, there's the swoon theory, uh, the idea that Jesus just fell unconscious on the cross, not that he died, and then he woke up again in the tomb. Now, that of course would have to assume that Roman soldiers, whose job it was to kill people, didn't actually know what dead was, and that believing somehow that Jesus, who was brought to within an inch of his life, somehow had the strength to roll back that stone and that without the Roman soldiers noticing. Uh, Okay, then, then there's the, uh, the theory, the mass hallucination theory, uh, that, that the 500 plus that Jesus appeared to, that they all shared the same hallucination. The, the problem with that is that there is no such thing as mass hallucinations where everybody sees the same thing um, and, and hallucinations aren't contagious. And we could keep going, but the point is this, um, with all of those theories, they all have one thing in common. There is not a single shred of evidence to support them. Now, why would I believe that somebody could rise from the dead? Why would I believe in Jesus' resurrection? I will be honest. The reason I believe it is because the Bible says it. Um, I believe it because scripture has convinced me of that truth. However, I do want to point out today um, that the truth of Jesus' resurrection um, is historically reliable and, and, and it does ring true. And, and there are six quick things that I want to point to uh, to kind of illustrate that. The first one, there were so many witnesses. Um, like we said before, there were, there were over 500 that Jesus appeared to at one time over many different, in many different instances over that 40 days. Not to mention the Gospels were widely disseminated very early on and there were literally thousands of people who could have discredited them if they weren't true. And so that's, that's the first thing. The second one would be um, that the, the, the writers include embarrassing details. Um, like the fact that they didn't even believe the women when they told them that, that Jesus had risen from the dead. If, if I'm writing one of the Gospels, um, I am going to, I'm going to make, or and I'm lying, I'm going to make myself look like the hero. Um, certainly, if you want to be believed, at that time, you wouldn't have made women the, the first witnesses as they weren't considered reliable witnesses at that time. Uh, the third thing is that there are so many details. Uh, just think of when you were in high school and you were lying to your parents, not that you ever did that, um, and they asked you, you know, to tell them where you were, what you were doing. Um, would you include, if you were lying, would you include more details or less details? Oh my goodness, you would include way less details, right? Like, where were you? Out. And you hope that that goes, right? Because the more, more details you include, the more they can poke holes in your story. The fact that the disciples unashamedly included a ton of details is indication that they were telling the truth. Um, the, the fourth one, the fact that there was no collusion. So read the, the four accounts of the resurrection in, in the Gospels and you will see um, that, that they are very different. They don't contradict one another, but they are very different. Kind of like if um, four people were standing on four corners and witnessing an accident and testifying in court, they're going to be describing the same accident, but they're going to be describing different details. Um, and that's what you have in the gospel accounts. Um, again, not contradictory, but very different, meaning that the, the gospel writers did not collude with each other. Like in court, if two witnesses have the exact same testimony, very often it'll be thrown out because it's called collusion, because they got together on the story. You don't have any indication of that in the gospel accounts. Uh, the next one is, uh, I just put martyrs. The fact that every one of the disciples uh, was, was willing to die for their faith and did die for their faith, all except one who was exiled for his faith. You simply don't die for a lie. Uh, Maybe, maybe you would die for the truth, right? But, but you certainly wouldn't die for a lie. Not, not in the way that these people did. Um, church history says that Nathaniel had his skin flayed off of him uh, before they crucified him. I mean, if I, if I get a paper cut, I, I'm done. I'm going to give up the lie if it's a lie. Um, the church history says that the apostle Peter had to watch his wife be crucified for three days before his eyes, before they crucified himself upside down. Um, Again, if it were a lie, they could have gone free if they would have simply said it was a lie. People don't die for a lie. Now, some people will say, well, what about, what about um, you know, people who die for their faith from many different faiths? They'll die for their faith even today. And I'll just say it this way. Um, if I die for my faith, if I become a Christian martyr, what does it prove? It doesn't prove that my faith is true. It proves that I believe my faith is true, Right? Way different with an eyewitness testimony. Uh, if an eyewitness dies for their faith, 
it proves that what they saw is true. And then the final one, um, that they were hand witnesses. Um, when Thomas doubted that Jesus rose from the dead, he said, I'm gonna, I need to touch the wounds in his side and on his hands. And so Jesus let him do that. He, they not only were eyewitnesses, they were hand witnesses. Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Uh, boiling it all down, uh, look at all the times that Jesus referred to the Old Testament and how he was the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. Think of all the times that Jesus claimed to be God and then showed himself to be God. Uh, so uh, Think of all the times that Jesus predicted that he would rise from the dead. So since Jesus is God, is it really so far-fetched to believe that he could raise someone from the dead? Here's the real question for today. What does it mean for you? Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. <laughs> It means that all of his promises are true. Think of it this way, if I say to you that I'm going to die and then three days later I'm going to come back to life, what would you think? You'd say, you're crazy, right? And you'd be right. Now what if I actually did it? Would you believe me if I made other promises? Yeah, you would because it would mean that I'm God. Now I'm not God, but Jesus is and it means that every promise is true. It means that he really does love you, he really does forgive you, and he really is going to take you to heaven one day. Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Uh, thanks so much for listening today. If you enjoy this podcast but want to go even deeper in your faith, I want to invite you to check out all the great content that we put out here at Time of Grace. Um, the easiest way for you to do that, and the way that I personally do that, is by signing up for the Time of Grace email. I might be biased, <laughs> but I think the Time of Grace team does a great job putting all into one email, a written devotion, a video devotion, a blog post, podcasting options, it's a way that I love to start my day. And if you want to go deeper with Jesus, it's a great way to start yours too. Just look for the link in the episode notes to sign up. And thanks for your support.